John, have you ever met yourself? I beg your pardon, Yunchi. Meeting yourself, as strange as it sounds, is a concept carved out by a fascinating psychologist, Carl Jung. He theorised that the self we assume to be a single entity might actually be a complex mosaic of different characters, archetypes as he called it. Sounds intriguing, but how exactly does one meet oneself? Remember how we shift roles in life? We might be a disciplined employee at work, while turning into a fun-loving friend at parties or a caring lover at home. These are not just roles. They represent different facets of our personality. Exploring and understanding these diverse segments help us meet ourselves. So each of these characters within us can be seen as individual entities, as part of the self, right? Perfectly nailed. These intrinsic characters, or archetypes as Jung named them, allow us to perceive the world and react in different ways. By recognising and understanding them, we can gain a comprehensive image of our authentic selves. And this journey of discovery would provide us a clearer map to navigate the tumultuous journeys of life, I suppose? Exactly, John. Life is a constant dance between these archetypes. This dance influences our behaviour, decision-making, and ultimately the kind of life we lead. Don't you sometimes feel that there is a side to your personality that doesn't frequently see the light of day, John? Well, Yunche, aren't there sides of us that we're not particularly fond of? Yes, but if we take a leaf out of Carl Jung's book, these sides are not necessarily bad. They're just different facets of us. The mosaic within us, as you earlier referred to it, right? Precisely. Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, believed that deep within the subconscious of everyone lays a wealth of shared knowledge and images. He called it the collective unconscious. So, we're talking about a pool of knowledge that everyone somehow taps into? You're not going to tell me that Jung hypothesised the existence of telepathy now, are you? Ha <laughs> ha, no, nothing of that sort. But stay with me, it's a bit mystifying. Jung suggested that the collective unconscious contains archetypes. These are universal symbols that can be seen across cultures. Universal symbols like... Take a mother, a hero or a magician, for example. These roles seem to emerge in myths, folktales and even our dreams, regardless of culture or epoch. All right, making sense. So, these universal characters, I mean, archetypes, they're part of these varied facets we're talking about. Yes, and they form a part of us, a part that we might not even consciously recognise. An understanding of these archetypes can reveal a lot about ourselves and our behaviours. So, let's jump right into those key archetypes that Jung defined. First and foremost is the persona archetype. Can you guess what that might be about, John? Is that the public mask we present to the world? Bingo! That's exactly it. The persona archetype represents the I that we present to the outside world. It is the role we play in society, influenced by our surroundings, culture and expectations. And I'm guessing there's more to it than that? Yes. Behind our persona, we find the shadow. This archetype is sort of the dark twin, representing those parts of ourselves that we hide, suppress or deny. Those are the aspects we're not particularly fond of, right? Exactly. We're not always comfortable showing our shadow, but it's an integral part of us. Embracing it helps us grow and better understand ourselves. And the final archetype? The self. This is where things get a bit philosophical. The self is not just the sum of persona and shadow, it transcends them, representing our wholeness. It's the archetype that urges us to grow, to realise our fullest potential. These archetypes seem like a map to journey within ourselves. Very aptly put, John. They house layers of our personality influencing our life, behaviour and choices in intriguing ways. Now, imagine this. You're confronted with a decision, say to take up a new job offer, or stay in your current position. How do you think our understanding of these archetypes can guide us in such situations? Well, I'm not sure. Can you walk me through that? Absolutely. If we consider the persona, it can help us understand the kind of roles we are comfortable playing. For instance, if your persona aligns more with a nurturing profile, you might find satisfaction in a job that allows you to care for or guide others. On the other hand, 
A persona that aligns with leadership could drive you towards positions of authority. So, does the shadow archetype highlight traits we'd rather avoid, or challenges we might expect in our roles? Exactly. Accepting our shadow helps in acknowledging our weaknesses. Understanding the shadow can help us anticipate difficulties and tailor our approach to handle challenges in our professional life. This understanding could also guide us towards seeking growth opportunities that help us address these shadow elements and evolve as individuals. And how does the self archetype factor into this? Self is our individual aim to realise full potential. It urges us to reach out for opportunities that not only satisfy our persona or acknowledge our shadow, but ultimately allow us to holistically grow. Whether that means taking up a new job or staying in a current one. It's the self that guides us towards our destination. Yunche, you made me curious about my own archetypes now. It's fascinating, isn't it? Let's delve deeper into your archetypes then. Well, considering my love for literature, I would say the persona of a scholar resonates with me. That sounds fitting, John. How does this scholar persona influence your decisions? I suppose it fuels my curiosity and drive for knowledge. That's probably why I chose to study English literature in the first place. I loved the idea of diving into a sea of stories and ideas. Interesting connection. How about the shadow? Any insight into what might that be for you? Hmm, that one's tough. But if I had to guess, perhaps it's my struggle with emotional vulnerability. Emotional vulnerability? Is it because you struggle with expressing your feelings? Well, yes, exactly. I often find it tough to open up and let my feelings show. I believe that traces back to the loss of my father. Despite my struggle, recognising this shadow aspect has actually been liberating. It's helped me understand why I react certain ways. John, you've given us a profound glimpse into yourself. What aspirations does your self-archetype hold? Truthfully speaking, I think myself aspires to break free of this restraint. I want to fully engage with my emotions, not suppress them. And perhaps along the way, influence others through the universal language of literature and stories. Yunchi, the discovery of my own archetypes has put many things into perspective, especially my interactions with others. Do you feel the same? I certainly do, John. Looking back at my interactions, I notice patterns I failed to acknowledge before. For instance, being an extroverted person, my persona archetype has unconsciously led the majority of my interactions. I've noticed that I always tend to make a concerted effort to set a positive environment. On the downside, this sometimes makes it challenging for me to handle conflicting situations effectively. The persona could be a double-edged sword, wouldn't you agree? It certainly could. But wasn't it Jung who said that the persona is but a compromise between individual and society? Did you know that Jung also suggested that conflicts with others often mirror conflicts within us? Our reaction to other people's words or actions might be mirroring our own shadow archetype. In my case, I've realised that my struggle with emotional vulnerability might have led me to unconsciously attract similar individuals, perpetuating a cycle of suppressed emotions. John, expanding on the shadow aspect, wasn't there an association with how we project onto others? I'm not very clear on that. Yes, projection refers to the tendency wherein elements of our shadow that we deny or reject get unknowingly projected onto others. It's like seeing in others what we fail to see in ourselves. Possessing knowledge of these archetypes can help us be more aware of such patterns and tendencies. This, in turn, can offer valuable insights into how we communicate and interact, improving our understanding of ourselves and those around us. It's truly enlightening, don't you think? You ever wonder, John, just how far these archetypes reach? You mean their prevalence across different cultures? Exactly. Archetypes are a common thread in stories shared by diverse cultures around the world. They aren't just constructs of our individual psyche, but shared broadly, resonating across humanity. So they're kind of global psychological patterns? In a way, yes. Take the hero, for instance. This archetype is prevalent in myths and folklore across the globe. From Achilles in Greek mythology to Arjuna in Hindu epics, the hero marches through dangers and challenges, fights against the odds and above all, transcends their personal limitations. 
So, whether we're reading about Theseus slaying the Minotaur or watching Luke Skywalker vanquish the Empire, we're seeing the hero archetype. Exactly, John. It's fascinating how these characters, although from differing cultural backgrounds, all fulfil the hero archetype. It seems to underscore an inherent human fascination with the idea of a champion, a figure who overcomes adversity and attains victory. I suppose that reaffirms Jung's theory of a collective unconscious. Are there other archetypes found globally as well? Absolutely. Look at the mother. The archetype stands for nurturing, care and creation. From the great mother of Native American mythology to the Earth Mother in various African cultures, the nurturing power of the mother speaks almost universally to us. Well, that's an apt example. Mothers are so elemental to human experience. Rather than being confined to individual psyches, these archetypes pervade our shared global narratives, reminding us of the underlying unity of human experience. So, Yunche. Did you know these Jungian archetypes can be seen across different religions too? Really, how so? Let's start with Christianity. Many see Jesus Christ as representing the self archetype, embodying the pursuit of wholeness and unity. But this isn't just limited to Christianity. Does that mean religious figures in general tend to embody the self archetype? Quite so. Each religious tradition has their own version of the self. For instance, in Buddhism, the idea of Buddhahood, or becoming a Buddha, has similarities to the pursuit of self-realization. The self in this context represents the attainment of enlightenment, the ultimate goal of individuals. Fascinating. That's liberal application of theories. But do these archetypes go beyond the self in religions? They do. Think of figures like Mother Mary in Christianity or Quan Yin in Buddhism. Both embody the mother archetype, symbolising compassion, protectiveness and nurturing traits. So, the persona of God, Buddha, deities are basically projections of these archetypes? It can be seen that way. In fact, if you observe various religious traditions, you'll find similar figures representing these archetypes. It's as though these archetypes speak to some universal aspects of the human experience. So... The principles of our psychological constructs influence the way we create and perceive our gods and spiritual figures. That's quite profound. Exactly, Yun Chai. If Jung's theory holds up, it's as if our collective unconscious creates these universal narratives seeped in religious and spiritual contexts, our inner workings projected onto the cosmos. Archetypes venturing beyond just religion, it also trickles into our modern day stories and narratives. In what sense, Yunche? Literature, movies, television series, you name it. Everywhere you see, these archetypal manifestations are penned or sketched. The hero's journey narrative is the predominant example. I'm quite familiar with the hero's journey. It's a narrative pattern where the protagonist goes through stages of initiation, adventure and return, isn't it? Precisely, John. And each phase with its unique character. The call to adventure crossing the threshold, meeting the mentor, ordeal, reward, the road back, resurrection and return are all aspects of our self, shadow and persona archetype. I see, like in the Star Wars films, Luke Skywalker begins as a young boy on Tatooine, yearning for adventure. That's the call to adventure igniting the spark in our self archetype, isn't it? Exactly, John. And the journey doesn't end there, each archetype evolves throughout the narrative. As Skywalker learns from Yoda, he's exploring his persona. His conflict with Darth Vader mirrors our internal conflict with our shadow archetype. Oh, Yunchi, that makes perfect sense now. I never connected Jung's archetypes with narratives in this way. And you know what's interesting? It's not confined to Western narratives. Our own Korean folk tales and dramas are loaded with Jungian archetypes as well. Could you give an example, Yun Che? Sim Cheong, in our traditional pansori, is a perfect representative of the mother archetype. Her unwavering devotion to her blind father and sacrifice illustrate the unconditional love and nurturing traits similar to the mother archetype outlined by Jung. That's truly an eye-opener, Yun Che. I never looked at Sim Cheong's story through this lens before. Also, it further validates the universal and cross-cultural appeal of Jung's theory. 
John, what are some well-known myths or traditional stories from your childhood? Well, there's Hungbu and Nolbu, a Korean folktale about two brothers with contrasting archetypes. Hungbu, the kind and selfless brother, represents the everyman archetype, whereas Nolbu, the greedy and callous elder brother, reflects the trickster. That's an excellent example, John. The everyman seeks connections and relates to others, while the trickster challenges the status quo and breaks norms, similar to Nolbu's behaviour in the story. That's interesting. I never thought of the brothers as archetypes before. So, Yunche, do you think everyone has a trickster within them? As surprising as it might sound, yes. We all have a bit of the trickster in us. It represents our innate desire to test boundaries and explore the unknown. It's not necessarily a negative archetype, just mischievous. Well, that makes sense. Even in my daily mail rounds, I've noticed the trickster in some of my colleagues when they play harmless pranks. But I wonder, do our listeners have their own archetypical stories? That's a fascinating question, John. I bet our listeners would love to share myths from their cultures that they see through the lens of Jungian archetypes. Perhaps they could leave their reflections and thoughts on our social media platforms after hearing our podcast. That's an engaging idea. We'll be eager to hear from you all. Your stories, thoughts, or any interesting archetypical tales from your culture. It will definitely make our exploration of archetypes even more enriching. You know, Yun Che, I've been wondering about the role of Jung's archetypes in modern psychoanalysis. Oh, that's a great question. Please enlighten us, John. Gladly. So as we discussed earlier, archetypes represent universal, mythic characters residing within our collective unconscious. In psychoanalysis, understanding someone's archetypes can give us deep insight into their conscious and subconscious behaviours, reactions and patterns. For example, if someone exhibits strong hero archetype traits, they might often be found taking charge and always trying to make things right. Absolutely. And these patterns aren't necessarily fixed. They can change over time, influenced by our experiences and personal growth. An intriguing aspect of modern psychoanalysis is not just understanding these archetypes, but how they interact and balance each other in shaping a person. I see. And I assume this doesn't just apply to individuation, but also to interpersonal relations. Right. On one hand, it can help individuals achieve better self-awareness and self-understanding. On the other, therapists can use this knowledge to understand their patient's psyche better, leading to more personalised and effective treatment strategies. That sounds fascinating, the possibility of tailoring therapy based on a person's archetypes. It indeed is. Modern psychoanalysis, aided by Jung's archetypes, allows us to delve into the hidden corridors of our minds understanding who we are beneath the surface. However, it's worth noting that analysis based purely on archetypes can lead to stereotyping or oversimplification. Seems like a delicate balancing act, John. Thanks for sharing. You know, John, earlier we discussed how therapists might use understanding of archetypes to empathise with their patients. Yes, it's an intriguing concept. Can you share more details about how these archetypes can be applied in therapy? Sure, I'd be happy to. Now imagine a therapist working with a patient who demonstrates strong outlaw archetype behaviours. This person may challenge the status quo, crave freedom and have a tendency to rebel against authority. Interesting. I suppose that understanding of this archetype would give some valuable insights into the individual's motivations and behaviour patterns. Exactly. Rather than labelling this person as a troublemaker or rebel, the therapist can approach them with understanding that these behaviours reflect a deeper, more symbolic part of their identity. By recognising this archetype within the patient, the therapist can better understand their true desires and fears, laying foundation for more effective therapeutic interventions. But how does a therapist choose which archetypes are relevant for a certain patient? That's a good question. Firstly, it's not a one-size-fits-all process. The identification of archetypes in therapy is a collaborative journey involving both patient and therapist. They might use narrative techniques to explore the patient's life stories, their significant influences and dreams. By detecting constantly recurring patterns and themes, 
the therapist can then suggest possible archetypal influences. So it's about patterns of behaviour, emotions and thoughts that collectively manifest as an archetype. But isn't there a risk of oversimplification or misinterpretation, as you mentioned earlier? Yes, and that's why it's crucial to approach this process with utmost sensitivity. Even if certain patterns align with an archetype, it's always important to remember that human beings are complex, multifaceted creatures. We can't be slotted neatly into categorical boxes. I see. So a comprehensive understanding of a person goes far beyond just identifying their archetypes. Undeniably. But in a therapeutic context, Jung's archetypes are a valuable tool that can provide the therapist a window into the likely behaviours, attitudes and emotional responses of their patients. Yunchi, since we've been discussing how archetypes affect personal behaviour, let's try a little analysis. What kind of archetypes do you think could be driving a famous personality, like, let's say, Elon Musk? Oh, well, interesting choice. He certainly is a character. The creator archetype comes to mind instantly, a person driven by the desire to produce and innovate, leaving a lasting mark on society. That's true. Musk is constantly pushing the boundaries in various industries like electric vehicles, space travel and artificial intelligence. But in his pursuit of these goals, isn't there a risk of him neglecting other aspects of his life or personality? Yes, and that's where understanding of these archetypes can be beneficial. It's not just about identifying them, but also understanding how they impact different aspects of life. For someone with a dominant creator archetype like Musk, there might be potential shadows being overlooked. So it's not just about celebrating the creator within Musk, but also recognising the potential shadow and what it may represent. Now I'm feeling curious about my own archetypes. Well, it's always healthy to do some introspection, John. Don't worry, an exploration of your own archetypes could be a rewarding journey. But Jung's theories, as pioneering and insightful as they are, haven't been without their fair share of criticism. That's an important highlight, John. Controversies only push us to question and dig deeper, don't they? Absolutely. Some critics argue that Jung's archetypes, the very cornerstone of his analytical psychology, are too vague and fluid to be measured accurately. Furthermore, aren't these archetypes heavily influenced by Jung's own cultural background? Eastern cultures, for instance, might interpret symbolisms differently. That in itself is a fair point. There's also the issue of Jung's theory being somehow deterministic. Assigning each person to a certain archetype could potentially limit the understanding of our complex human nature. Right. Let's also consider the universality that Jung proposed. The notion of a collective unconscious that all humans share can be seen as controversial. Is it really possible to think that ancient mystic symbols and ideas have somehow transcended time and space to reside in all of us? I must admit that's quite a remarkable concept. While I'm in awe of the thought, I have my reservations about its empirical backing. I mean, isn't human experience so diverse across cultures, geography and time? Can one truly pinpoint universal elements in such diversity? Well, that's a conundrum. No theory is impervious to debate, and it seems Jung's is no exception. Reflecting on our journey today, I think it's safe to say Jung's theory raises more questions than it provides answers. Yes, but isn't that the beauty of psychology, John? It's a continuously evolving dialogue, where each answer is unique and personal. True. Being able to tap into our own archetypes and reflect on them feels like we have a secret decoder for our psyche. Despite the criticism and controversies around archetypes, I think it's intriguing and useful for self-exploration. I agree, John. Just like how a student's understanding of the world expands through learning, our journey into Jungian archetypes helped us understand our individual personalities better. Right. Uncloaking my shadow, exploring my persona... It sure was a different yet significant experience. And what about you, Yunchi? Did you ever think understanding your archetypes would impact your understanding of your role as a teacher? Initially, I had doubts. But now I see the potential in using archetypal understanding in my profession, like interpreting a child's behaviour. This understanding could actually enhance my techniques in classroom management and conflict resolution. 
our journey unveiled the notion that we each have a world within us, shaped by universal patterns. Jung's theory might be an old pair of glasses, yet they offer a clear, introspective view of our inner landscape. Just like how every piece of a jigsaw puzzle contributes to the bigger picture, every archetype within us contributes to who we are. This exploration indeed has been mind-opening. I urge all to embark on their journey of self-discovery. Here's what we're leaving you with. Find your jigsaw pieces, assemble your picture, and see what it tells you about yourself. After all, the desire for self-understanding is a journey without an end.